dairies are dumping milk, hatcheries are culling chicks in some cases, piglets are being killed, crops are rotting in, in the ground in some cases, and what is going on? What is happening to this? And, and shouldn't we be concerned about this? Because won't there be second and third order effects to all of that disruption in the supply chain, specifically with agriculture, food, milk, eggs, all of that? Yes, you should be absolutely concerned about it. And I'm not talking about being irrationally fearful. I'm saying a very healthy, uh, normal fear that drives to action. That's a good thing. Okay, so, so concern and worry about things that are necessary to worry about, that's, what, that's good to go. So I'm gonna talk now about the supply chain system and why these things are happening. Hey, more unsolicited thoughts on the current situation. And for today, I wanna to talk briefly, and I'll try and be brief. I'm not very good at that, on uh, supply chains. And so some of the, uh, the issues occurring right now with supply chain in the United States and elsewhere. And it's really predicated on a couple couple things. Number one is uh, what's called just-in-time inventory. And I did other videos on, on this as part of my self-sufficiency series. But just-in-time just in inventory, real quick, is, is basically only getting the, the raw materials that you need at the time that you need it. And what this does is it creates great efficiency reduces inventory requirements and um, essentially saves companies lots of money uh, because of it. Uh, it's very efficient. It came about in the 50s from Toyota and it's deeply embedded into um, you know lean manufacturing and Six Sigma and all that. And it's excellent um, for certain things. But what we're seeing today is the dark side of just-in-time inventory. And the dark side of it is its fragility, or some people will say brittleness. And I would just simply say that it's susceptibility to shock, supply shock, demand shock, whatever. And we're seeing that today. Now, one thing to understand is that this, this uh, fragility or... Um, um, susceptibility of just-in-time inventory is absolutely known. It's been known. Everyone understands that it's a great system, but because of all the interdependency upon all the different distributors, providers of raw materials, processors, that it's fragile. And, um, you know, it's fragile in the sense that as long as if those things don't line up, then it can fall apart, which is what is happening now in some cases. Okay, in other cases, it's holding. Um, but, but understand it like this. say So for this to work, you have to have all of these providers of raw materials, producers, um, and all these different pieces in the chain all kind of working together, all forecasting properly. They've got to forecast the proper demand and be able to provide all of these things just in time, okay, so that we don't have to have this this um, a big buildup of inventory and storage and all of that. And so you could use a lot of examples. Um, but first, let's look at what is the what would be the opposite of just in time. Well, you know, you, you could look at different things, uh, but just in time inventory. Um, um, as opposed to just in case inventory, and that just in case inventory is having pro, um, inventory on hand that can handle any um, demand surge, for example. Okay, so you have an increased demand for something. Well, we can do it because we have all this inventory that we can push out, and and it, and it can fulfill that need, albeit temporary, and it, and it has its own it has its own downfalls as well, right? The increased cost of storage, etc. Just in time also requires more small batch type type of um, manufacturing and production. Okay, small batch type type things. You only do it as you need it. 
And in many cases, this makes sense because overall, it is less expensive, even when you're doing small batches and you're, you're losing a little bit of economy of scale to some, some degree, but you make up for it in this whole, in the whole system. All right, so we have just-in-time and we have just-in-case inventory. What we're seeing right now is um, significant shock, right? We have supply and demand shock in different areas. And I wanna use an example to try and explain this. And I wanna use the idea of, or the, the, the dairies right now. So you have a dairy, right, providing milk. We have dairies that are providing milk that makes cheese. And we have dairies that are providing milk for the retail sector. And we have dairies that are providing milk for, the, for industry, for schools and restaurants and food distribution networks and all that. Now, I am not an expert, I'm not a dairyman, and um, so I'm gonna probably mess up the technical details. Don't hammer me on the technical details. I'm using this as an illustration to talk about supply chain management, and specifically the, the, um, the vulnerability of just-in-time inventory and why we need to shift away from it. And I've been talking about this for many years. I think in some cases, just-in-time inventory makes complete sense, even to this day. And in other cases, in critical areas, it, it, we shouldn't be doing it, okay? And, but there's something that you can do about it. Okay, so let's take the dairy, for example, and I'm really talking about the fact that dairies are dumping milk, right? Everybody's heard of this, dumping milk right now. And you're probably asking yourself, why? Why are they dumping milk? I'm actually being rationed at the store and can only buy, you know, one gallon at a time or two gallons at a time of milk. This doesn't make any sense. Well, it does if you understand the supply chains behind it. And really what it boils down to is there's two different supply chains when it comes to milk. You have the retail supply chain, which is going to the stores, your traditional, you know, one gallon or three quarters a gallon as they shrunk the packaging and kept the price the same. All, you know, all that. Um, you ha And then you have industry supply chains, right? You have um, food for or milk for restaurants and schools. Well, demand on the, on this side has absolutely collapsed, right? Restaurants and schools. Schools are closed. Restaurants, even though they're doing curbside pickup and delivery and all that, they're still look at if you look at the numbers, they're way down. They're they're just, you know, your your fancy restaurants are are down by like 80 or 90%. Your mid-grade restaurants are down by like 65%. And even your fast food Type places overall are down by about 50%. Okay, that's a, that's a massive a trough in demand. That is a huge cut in demand. So therefore, they don't need, the processors don't need the milk. And so the, the dairymen are dumping it. Why are they dumping it? You know, why don't they donate it? Um, well, a couple of reasons. One, they might be in a state where raw milk is, is illegal Therefore, it has to get processed. Well, they don't process milk, okay? So again, another problem with the supply chain is that the dairy does one thing. They milk cows, okay? And they temporarily store that milk and trucks show up just in time. Refrigerated trucks take the milk, they take it away. The truck takes it to the processor. The processor either pasteurizes the milk or maybe it's one that that um, makes cheese or whatever. And they get that product from the truck just in time. And then they do what they need to do. But you know, like look at, look at so some of these there or processors have entire lines that are just for schools, for example. Those are like almost immediately uh, shut down. Okay, just totally shut down. Those entire lines are just like, went from this capacity to zero on projections, okay? So they're like, don't bring me any more milk trucks, okay? And then the trucks are like, sorry, farmer, I'm not showing up because I have nowhere to bring the milk. And so therefore the farmer, his, the least cost to him is to dump it, okay? And then the other problem with that is like, you, this is not something you just don't turn on and off. You can't just turn the switch, shut the factory off and, and, and furlough your employees and go home. Okay, you can't just stop milking a cow. <laughs> that doesn't just, you can't do that, right? And there's, there's, there's these things turn slowly. Okay, so, so then you have 
the end user, the school, is not receiving the milk, right? The restaurants are receiving much less milk, if any, right? Therefore, the processors are doing less processing. The truckers are doing less trucking. The farmer is still having the milk, and so they're dumping the milk, okay? And that shows the fragility of that supply chain. On the other hand, you have dairies providing for retail. However, they are they also have that similar same just-in-time supply chain for most of them. And, they, you know, they're still doing, they're still compartmentalized. And so there's still a lot of things that can go wrong in that supply chain, right? So you're, you're in, um, you're in Idaho and you're buying milk from Costco. And, you know, that milk probably was, came from a cow in Wisconsin or something, right? I don't know that for a fact, but it's, that's probably the case or somewhere, right? And so that, all, that whole supply chain has got to happen. Well, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Now, so when, again, and just in time inventory is going well, it's like, it's amazing. Okay. But, it, but the fragility of it is, is showing up now, big time. Now contrast this with the small dairy. And I'm using an example. I have a friend here who runs a small dairy of this locally. He milks his cows, bottles his own milk, sells them to his networks that are local. Okay, so and in a couple different sales channels, in stores, different stores, and direct to customers. The resilience of that supply chain is much higher. I mean, is there still risk there? Of course, of course. I mean, if if demand locally dropped, you might be in a similar situation. However, how are they doing? They're doing great. Okay, not not because you know of any. Um, particular advantage of the situation, but because of that supply chain is so, so local and therefore it's more resilient. Okay. And therefore it is successful right now. So it is really, it's the direct contrast of all of this. All right. Now, um, I've talked about this many times before and I talk about, about how, how do we receive our food? And I use food as an example because it's one of the essentials. Okay. We're not talking about automobiles or books for example, or some other gadgets that aren't really necessary. Okay, food is necessary. And we, we do this, we have this system, this is food system, where we're getting food from thousands of miles away, internationally, nationally, thousands of miles away, um, and then on down. Then we get some of our food regionally, and then we get a very small amount locally, and then we grow either little to none ourselves. Okay, what we need to do is flip that model. We need to flip that model, okay? So we need to be growing, I think, a lot ourselves, okay? So, I mean, we would transform this country if if the average person grew even 10% of all of their own food. Transform it, no question about it, because they would intimately understand supply chains. They would intimately understand what it takes to grow your own food, high-quality food, etc. many reasons. Then we have a big swath that should be done locally, right? So we talk about local, local. Okay, that, that's legit, and we should be doing that. And you have to know your farmer to establish resiliency in your own supply chain. Okay, and then we can go a little bit more. It can come from regionally, and then a small part at the top of that pyramid, that can come nationally, internationally. That's fine, right? That's how it should be. And so that's my recommendation to, to you is that you look for ways to do that. How do you, in, in your own personal life, invert that pyramid? Okay, so again, you on the bottom providing for some of your own needs, then locally through your network and your community. Okay, then regionally, then nationally, internationally. And that's really the bottom line is that you figure out ways that you can do that as much as possible. Okay, and that's what we talk about on this channel a lot and all the, you know, all the time. And we've been talking about these types of things for years. So one, one other thing that you can do besides figure out ways to brainstorm and figure out ways that where you can invert your triangle is you can watch the um, series I did on self-sufficiency. A self, a person who is more self-sufficient is more resilient and is better able to handle shock, right? Because your supply chain is intimately Local, the supply chain doesn't get any shorter than you grow your own food, okay, or some of your own food, 
Okay, and that's that's really I don't even advocate trying to achieve 100% self-sufficiency. I've never advocated that. I advocate a healthy, robust amount of self-sufficiency with some interdependence. First, within your own family. Second, within your own network. Third, within your own community. Fourth, locally, then regionally, then then nationally and internationally. Okay, so I want to take, give you some of my thoughts on on uh, supply chain. Hopefully that example wasn't too out of the box or incorrect, uh, but that's the way I see it. And, and the more important lesson again is the the um, the shock and disruption in just in time inventory. It's great for certain things. I do advocate it for you want to you want to do use just in time inventory for building cars and um, uh, publishing books and, and and making gadgets and, and clothes even. Absolutely, we absolutely do that. But we should use just in case type inventory management for critical needs. Okay, critical needs. More importantly than that is that inverted triangle. Those critical needs should be the ones that we're mainly getting from down here on the lower end of the pyramid. Okay, there we go.